Well, good morning, students, and welcome to chapel. Uh, before we begin, there are a couple of things I would like to uh, draw your attention to uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, first of all, this Monday we have our uh, last worship night, the gathering, at uh, 9 o'clock Monday night uh, in the loft. So uh, come on out for that um, and be a part of that. And as always, we will have food afterwards. So that's this Monday at 9. And then uh, in celebration of the end of the school year and to kick off finals week, uh, Student Life will be hosting once again Midnight Breakfast Sunday on uh, May 9th at 11 59 p.m. So head on over to the CAF on Sunday, May 9th at 11.59 to be part of Midnight Breakfast getting back to normal, right? So um, be there for that. And then on Tuesday, May 11th, uh, Calvary Baptist Church uh, will be uh, hosting uh, an event here giving away free Chick-fil-A sandwiches. So uh, make sure you guys come out to that. More details about that uh, will be posted on our social media so be looking for that so may 11th chick-fil-a right so all right that's all the announcements i have so let's begin chapel with a word of prayer so bow with me as we pray uh, and begin our worship this morning oh god in heaven you are king of the universe father you um you are king of kings and we bow before you before your throne recognizing your rule and reign, uh, Father, over all things. And as we think about that, Father, we think about the loving kindness that you have as a good and gracious king that you are. And so, Father, today we, f we pray that our praises lift high your name as king of the universe, as king of kings. Father, we pray that our praise will be filled um, with joy as we lift your name high. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand with us? In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley. The night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid, for Jesus bled. And suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are real. to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. What sweet worship this morning. Thank you so much for being here. As many of you already know, this is the second to last chapel of the semester. You're supposed to go, oh, oh, it's almost over. And uh, after next week, uh, it'll all be downhill, finals will be on their way, and we'll be ending up a new, uh, ending a semester and getting ready in the fall to start a new semester. And so we've been really blessed this year. And again, I want to commend you for your great uh, participation in mask wearing and social distancing and all the things that we did this semester to try to keep COVID at bay here on our campus. And uh, uh, we weren't without some of our uh, employees getting COVID. In fact, uh, Tim is here today. Tim was in the hospital and very sick. We prayed for Tim. And would y'all give Tim a warm welcome today? He's back in chapel today. There he is. And 
We've been praying for Tim and loved him and so glad that the Lord uh, restored him to health and has him back here on campus. What a great uh, time to be in chapel today. I have my good friend, Dr. Lawrence Clapp. A uh, lot I can say about uh, Dr. Clapp. He's been in ministry for over 40 years. He answered the call to ministry in grade school. His father was a pastor, his mother a pianist, a great couple. In fact, his dad invited me to preach the very first revival I ever preached. And I was so excited at the end of the week, I think I got, I don't know, $100, $200, something like that for preaching this revival for a number of nights. And on my way back to a seminary that night, I got a traffic ticket for speeding and uh, it cost me more than the revival, but the experience was well worth it. And uh, that's how I got to know uh, Dr. Clapp and had an opportunity to preach at his church when I was at Duke. And uh, we have built a great friendship over the years. He's a graduate of Gardner-Webb University. After attending undergraduate, he went to Southeastern Seminary where he completed a Master of Divinity and a doctorate degree. And uh, he moved to Asheville to pastor, and it was there on a, doing some summer mission that he met his wife, Jenny, which is the best thing that ever happened to him. And uh, then in January of 1985, he was called to serve as pastor at South, South Elm Street Baptist Church. He's been there all these years, and the Lord has blessed his ministry and uh, blessed his uh, family. He now has how many grandchildren now, Lawrence? Three? Three grandchildren. In fact, he just became a grandpa again for the third time with the new baby, from his daughter Olivia and so here's what I know about Dr. Clapp he loves Jesus he loves the gospel he's a Christmas fanatic and known as many as Mr. Christmas he loves playing golf he loves mowing the yard he likes to watch Andy Griffith and he's particularly fond of Duke basketball and football so hey give him a warm welcome today here for being in chapel He's one of the few people I have back every year. Why? Because he's my friend. Why? Because I love him. And why? Because he's a faithful example of what it means to be a minister of the gospel. Well, I'm going to read John's, uh, John's gospel, chapter number 18, beginning in verse number 28. This is uh, Dr. Clapp's text for the day. And so if you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn there. John chapter 18, verse number 28 uh, through verse number 40. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, but I might not be, that, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And, and he had said this. He went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no fault in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. If you would please stand with us again as we worship one last time together this morning. <laughs> In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. 
watching who did not get to see the video, it's called The Bible Contains from Igniter Media. One thing the Bible contains uh, or does not contain, it's, it's kind of interesting. We talk about the Bible and we say the Bible contains the Word of God. Uh, actually, the Bible is the Word of God. And it speaks very clearly to us. And so with that backdrop, I'm going to speak to you. I do bring a greeting from North Carolina, from South Elm Street Baptist Church. I've been coming here for approximately nine years. This is my 10th time. Uh, I've been with Dr. Allen and his family. And you, you've become my family. And I've learned to love you and appreciate you very much. I've met many of you over the couple of days that I've been here. And I hope to meet many more of you. But I wanted to bring a, a challenge to you today about what is truth. That's a very old question, and it dates back to Pilate. In John 18, 38, Dr. Allen read, and it said, what is truth? Pilate asked that question of Jesus point blank. With this, he went against the Jews because here's what he said. I find no fault or charge or no basis against this man. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at a time at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? If you remember the story that he just read, they said, well, we have, we have no king but Caesar. So what does this have to do with you and with me? Plenty. Let me show you how this is going to apply to us. We live in a world, and in our world, culture has determined how we live. It determines what you wear, what you eat, where you go, what you listen to, what you drive. It's going to determine where you live one day. So culture seems to be in charge. Our country has been divided over all types of ideologies. In fact, what we call truth is considered outdated and it's past. We have questions in North Carolina uh, we still have to wear masks everywhere we go. It's not optional. Uh, we have to do this. So we have to decide, uh, do we wear a mask or not wear a mask? I remember a few years ago, we were trying to decide which music do we have in church. Do we have uh, old dead music or do we have a live uh, contemporary music? Uh, now we decide, is it mask or no mask? We decide, are we, are, are we going to take the vaccination or not? Such terminology as CRT has taken a forefront more than the gospel. Racial divide has escalated rather than subsided. Sexuality has taken a whole different role. There are many today who would say to us homosexuality is okay. After all, uh, what was written in Romans was added uh, much later on, and it wasn't really in the original manuscripts. It was certainly, it made it somehow into the canon. We no longer see sex outside of marriage as a sin because, you see, we have to try, everybody. everybody's got this attitude of, we have to try it on. We have to see if we like each other before we get married. We have to see if we're compatible. We're living in a day when moral and sexual failure is more the rule than the exception. It's even in our Christian circles. We've witnessed Christian leaders falling into sin, not really falling into it, but diving headlong into sin and swimming around in it as if it's okay. It started with denominational leaders, pastors, megachurch pastors, teachers, presidents of universities, even government leaders are boldly walking and living in sin. So what is truth that's messed us up? We don't know what truth is. Is there a truth? Is there an absolute truth? Is there something that's 100% true all of the time? Is the Bible really reliable? Is it the word of God? As a pastor, I answer more questions about morality and what is right and what is truth than any other subject. And most often it's from the younger people who are looking at the older people going, they taught us one thing and you're telling us something else. The Bible contains the word of God and God is speaking to us. And here's what it said. Let's go back to this story. I'm going to tie all this together very quickly. 
If a Jew entered a house of a non-Jew, a Gentile, they were considered ceremonially unclean, verse 28 of chapter 20. That person could not worship in the temple until they were cleansed. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we could just become cleansed and come to worship? So these accusers stayed outside the house and they hurled their insults in at Jesus because they didn't want to come in and be undefiled. They kept their bodies ceremonially clean. They followed the rules. Their hearts were defiled and filled with hatred and deceit. They were murderers, yet they never drove a spike or a nail. Are we clean on the outside, yet filthy with sin, tainting our hearts on the inside? Are we guilty of spiritual murder while we practice Christian ideals on the outside? Pilate, he thought he was in charge in this situation. Because you see, he was the ruler in Judea, according to verse 29 that we read. Pilate pilfered the temple for money, possessions, and treasures. And what he actually did was he took that plunder and he sold it and he built an aqueduct for his own glory. Pilate loathed, he hated, he despised the Jews. But when these irresponsible Jews brought Jesus to stand before him, he made it very clear that he could not justify their accusations against Jesus. Pilate saw right through these religious leaders' motives. He attempted to pass the buck right back to them, and they, in turn, wanted the government to pass judgment on Jesus, verse 30. He knew that these leaders hated Jesus, and the reason he knew that was because he saw in them the deception that was in his life. It was just like him. Uh, it kind of reminded me of the old saying, it takes one to know one. Well, Pilate knew them very well because they were living by the standard that Pilate had, and they were the religious leaders. Pilate did not want to be their scapegoat or their guy that was going to bail them out. He wanted no part of executing Jesus. In his mind, he was not going to be responsible, or so he thought. The truth is, none of us, not you, not me, not Dr. Allen, uh, his wife, his children, uh, no professor, no, no staff person at the school, uh, no one can be neutral about Jesus. We must decide. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, he's a stark raving madman lunatic, or he truly is the son of God. We have to make that choice. These leaders could not sentence Jesus to death themselves, so they needed someone who was in authority to do their dirty work for them. Are we guilty sometimes of getting someone else to do our dirty work for us? They knew a Roman leader had to pronounce the judgment that they desired. Death, kill him, get rid of him, shut him up, get him completely away from us. It was interesting. Pilate initially refused. He refused to do what they were asking him to do. He was not going to be their puppet. He said there's not enough evidence to convict Jesus of any wrong. Right before their very eyes, Jesus was becoming a pawn in a political arena and for ridiculous trumped-up charges. You go to verse 31 that we just read. Pilate even tried to barter and deal with Jesus to get Jesus to make a plea bargain or a deal. How often do you and I try to barter with God? How often do we try to bargain and deal with Jesus in order to be more comfortable in our decisions of life. See, Pilate tried to shift the responsibility to someone else, verse 31. In fact, he tried to find a way of escape from the responsibility and release Jesus, verse 39. Having tried, Jesus tried, flogged, beaten beyond recognition in an attempt to save Jesus' life in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 19, he said, I'll even go this far. I will do everything I can to maim Jesus so that he can live. In verse 15, he tried to appeal to the sympathy of Jesus' accusers. But just like those in that day, every person, you, me, all of us, we have to decide what we're going to do with Jesus. 
You see, crucifixion was a common execution for Roman citizens who were criminals, according to Matthew 20. And then, of course, chapter 18, verse 32 of John we read. Pilate had to ask if, if the request these leaders was making Were they actually trying to manipulate Roman law? Were they trying to use the law of the land to quiet the Savior of the world? Now, he didn't ask it quite that way, but that's what he was asking in verse 34. Were these a bunch of rebellious people who were trying to accuse Jesus of trying to establish a new government and a new ideology, a new way of thinking? They were appealing to Pilate in terms of treason toward Rome. They were using the word king to set Jesus up. Before you get angry, I want you to ask yourself, what word do we use to set Jesus up? They said he was claiming to be the Messiah. Who in their right mind would claim to be the Messiah? They said he was planning to overthrow Rome. He's going to come in and he's going to have a coup and overthrow the government. They said he was not their king because after all, Caesar's their king. They're under Roman rule. They appealed to the law of the day and the law of the land. Hey, our law says we have to do it this way. They did not refer to him at this point as Messiah because that would mean that he was a religious leader, not a political leader. And the government would not be as concerned with a religious leader as a political leader. Jesus, you know why they were mad at Jesus? He had exposed their hearts. The Bible says elsewhere that we oftentimes have a form of godliness, but it denies the power of God. All Jesus did was tell the truth. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Wait a minute, Jesus is in prison. He's beaten beyond recognition. Are you telling me that this Jesus that we're talking about is really a Jesus of truth? He exposed their hearts. They were angry. They were mad. They were, they were almost rabid. How in the world could somebody call me out? What gives him the right to call me out? Have you ever said that? Somebody called you out and you said, who died and left you in charge? What gives you the right to call me out? Pilate point blank asked Jesus who he was, verses 36 and 37. I love it. Jesus, he didn't mince any, he, he mince no, no words about this thing. He, he picked no bones about it. Jesus answered very clearly. You know what Jesus said? And it messed them up. He said his kingdom was not of this world. He's already thrown a monkey wrench into what they're asking. Pilate heard that as truth and he found no fault in Jesus. I don't know why so everybody's so upset about this. What he said was, my kingdom is not a political kingdom. It's a kingdom over your hearts. It's a kingdom over control of your mind. It's a kingdom that the word gives you uh, truth every moment for every day. Pilate found that Jesus was innocent of any crime. Maybe for a fleeting second, Pilate's sitting there and he looks and he goes, wow, this is truth. Unfortunately, did you hear me? Unfortunately, Pilate chose not to make that truth personal. What a tragedy to fail to acknowledge truth. What a tragedy when we recognize that truth is real, but we do not submit our lives to follow that truth. Pilate chose to go with the crowd, not with the cross. When you go to verse 38, Pilate thought he was a genius. Here's where he thought he was in charge. He came up with this most cynical question. 
What in the world is truth? Truth for way too many people is what the majority believes or thinks. Truth is what people come to submit their lives to. For way too many people, truth is what makes them feel comfortable as they are. When we do not have a standard of truth, we do not have a moral righteousness or a right way of living or thinking that we adhere to. You see, when we do not have an absolute truth, See, some of us want truth, but we don't want absolute truth. Absolute truth is 100% true 100% of the time. When we do not have an absolute truth, there's no means for moral righteousness. At that moment, we can't tell right from wrong. Justice becomes whatever the mass says. Justice becomes whatever works. Justice becomes anything goes as long as we all agree on it. Let's get a committee together and let's agree on what is right. Jesus, on the other hand, in his word, the word of God, it contains everything we need for life. It is the standard by which we measure every aspect of our lives, no matter how great or small our lives may be. Bottom line, Jesus teaches us how to live, period. A number of years ago, the bracelet read WWJD, what would Jesus do? Became a fad. And then a lot of folks kind of lost track of the bracelet when they started doing what they wanted to do, not what Jesus wanted them to do. Well, the question came, to release Barabbas or to release Jesus? To release Barabbas was to release the most vile criminal against Rome back out into society, verse 40. It has been so beautifully stated, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. See, the Jews hated being subjected to Rome. They hated paying taxes. They despised government intervention. And they were afraid of Barabbas. But you know what they hated more than anything? They hated Jesus more than that. So today I ask the question, what in the world is truth? Truth is, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one's going to come to the Father except through faith in me. I'm preaching through John at our church. It's been a long journey. My folks are like, when are we ever going to get done with John? When we read the last verse. John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, have it to the fullest possible measure. You know what truth is? Truth is Jesus looking at you and looking at me and saying, come unto me all who are beaten and battered and, and confused by life and who are weak and you're burdened down by all these questions and issues that you can't answer. Uh, come unto me, I will give you rest, is what Jesus is saying. When I look at the Bible and I ask what is truth, truth is that Jesus left the throne of heaven he came to this earth, was born of a virgin. He lived his life on this earth to show us how to live, to teach us because we are visual learners. He came to show us exactly what the Father wanted. He died on a cross. He was buried. He rose again. And that's not the end of the gospel. We always stop there, but the gospel goes so much further. The gospel is that Jesus now is the right hand of the Father, and he's praying for every one of us here today, those who are watching online and those who are in here, and he's praying that we make the right decision to follow him so that we could know God. Jesus is praying that today we get truth. 
we understand and comprehend truth. What is truth? Truth is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. Would you view this with me? The news I bring you today is the simple news. Today will you commit yourself to the cross event, to Jesus as Savior and Lord, or will you go with the crowd? In a time when many leaders are failing, when we're being confused by what people are calling facts. Will you trust in the crowd or will you trust in Jesus Christ? Will you submit yourself, commit yourself to the greatest love that's ever been? I don't care where you are in life today and I'm gonna close in just a moment. But what I know is this, Remember the lady who said, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done and yet he loved me. She had been loved by the world's standard but when she met Jesus in the love of Christ, 
she understood for the first time what it truly meant to be loved. In just a moment, I'm going to sit over here on the stage as I do every time I come. I'm going to sit right here. If you want to talk to me, you can come talk to me. I've had both vaccinations. I'll put on a mask. We'll social distance. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you about your relationship to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here and you need to recommit your life to Christ. Maybe you need to receive Christ. I would never assume. I went to, I went to a college that was a Baptist college. and Are you kidding? I would say 65 or 70% of the people there were not believers. So I'm not foolish enough to think everybody here is a believer. I'd love to tell you how you can know Jesus today, how you can know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Maybe you're here today and God's called you to ministry. I talked with one of your professors over lunch yesterday. And we both share the same burden that young men and women are not saying, hey, God's calling me to ministry. What if God's calling you? Would you be willing to do that? It's a tough life. It's getting harder. And to be exact, Anthony, I, I, will, I will complete my 50th year of preaching this year. Started at 15. Maybe God's calling you to be a missionary. Maybe God's calling you to submit your life somehow to truth and telling everybody there's truth. I'll tell you what, the greatest feeling in your, world, your life is to know that you're saved and ready to meet Jesus Christ. I remember in seminary, we would go in and one of our professors, he would come in every day, black suit, white shirt, black tie, and he would stand and he would say, ladies and gentlemen, would you stand with me? Would you sing? And every day in that class, we sang, when I survey the wondrous cross. And every day, that seminary professor, tears would stream down his face and fall onto his Bible because he met Jesus and his life was never changed. I'll be seated over here for just a few minutes. If you'd like to talk to me, you got plenty of time. You're getting out two minutes early today. So would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time, for the truth. And I pray you'll set us free with the truth that Jesus loves us. Guide us in Direct us as we come to you, God, as we give our hearts to you. Would you set us free? Would you cleanse us? Would you make us ceremonially clean? And God, may we be able to say, Jesus is Lord. When we sing about the cross, may we sing it with conviction and love and grace and mercy and deliverance. Thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is it the cross or the crowd? God bless you.